When I came to Washington as a journalist more than 30 years ago, India and the United States were in a difficult relationship. They barely talked to each other, and when they did, it was mostly to score points. The conversation seemed passive-aggressive. The two democracies had no love language, only a dictionary of stern words they threw across the room when given a chance. An air of forced tolerance prevailed. That was the opening passage of the preface to veteran journalist and writer Sima Siroi's latest book, Friends with Benefits, the India-US Story. Travelling back to the twilight of Cold War days, Sima's book offers fascinating insights into the changing dynamic between the two democracies, often hobbled by their own democratic impulses. Meticulously researched and compellingly written, the book is perhaps the first of its kind chronicle of the India-US story since the late 1980s. Sima Sirohi. First, my compliments on a, a, an extremely meticulously researched book, but that's only to be expected from you, Sima. Uh, Thank you very book. much. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I was telling a couple of friends here that it's amazing what a serious journalist can produce. People are just have forgotten what a serious journalist is. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but thank you for the compliment. I did my best. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's like I said, it's remarkably rich in the details uh, crowding the India-US relations for over 30 years. What was the process, uh, your process uh, of gathering and organizing the information? Because it's a very long time. Yes. So, you know, the one smart thing I would say that I did over the years that I was reporting from Washington, I kept all my articles, my clips from the Telegraph, and I kept uh, sort of organizing them by year. And so I had this couple of boxes, you know, full of uh, paper clippings. And then when I decided to write the book, I sort of went through them, chose the important stories, again, put them by year. And then I just started writing and I kept it chronological because I thought it's interesting for the reader. It's easier for the reader to follow um, the developments rather than organize the book on issues, you know, like non-proliferation or the nuclear deal or something like that. Right. Because Did then I you would go back and forth. Right. It unfolds, I was, from what I read so far, it unfolds as a story which has a very specific direction. So I'm glad you chose that path. Yeah, one of my think tank friends sort of advised me to do that. And okay. I'm glad I followed her advice. Okay. You know, as an Indian foreign correspondent in D.C. Uh, a long time ago, what were your earliest challenges as you began reporting uh, such a complex uh, world capital? Well, I would say the biggest challenge was access because, you know, foreign journalists in Washington, D.C. are like dime a dozen. There's right. so many. Everybody has somebody there, you know, from various countries. So there's a hierarchy. It's natural that the U.S. administration sort of deals with journalists they consider important. So in that hierarchy, obviously, the New York Times and ABC, CBS and Washington Post, they come on top. Then come a couple of foreign journalists, maybe the Financial Times, the Economist or the Guardian. Then there are local sort of um, outlets um, where the president is from. If the president is from Alabama, the Alabama journalists get more sort of importance. Foreign journalists from South Asia, I would say pretty much uh, towards the bottom of the pole. <laughs> it's such a remarkable pecking order that you laid out. With that kind of pecking order, I'm, I'm curious how as a young new corres foreign correspondent in DC, what, what were your first steps to get a handle on something like I said, as complex as Washington? Well, the first thing was to meet uh, State Department officials who were dealing with South Asia. 
and uh, sort of uh, Indian embassy officials, the ambassador of India. These were very key uh, sort of contacts for all of us. And uh, generally speaking, the press officer of the South Asia Department and the State Department was accessible. I mean, uh, he didn't tell us a whole lot, uh, but if you were able to make friends with one of the two officials, then on background, they would tell you a few things. Uh, but it was a tough slog, I would say. You know, there was no internet, remember that. When right. I came to DC, it was 1988 when I first arrived and became the correspondent for the Telegraph of Calcutta. There was no internet. We had to go to a place called the Foreign Press Center, look at the newspapers, look at the magazines, you know, figure out what's going on um, and proceed from there. You know, I'm, I'm sure some of my viewers wouldn't be able to even process the idea of uh, pre-internet age and getting information without any search help from anyone at all, except your own work. Oh, let me poke, you know, give another data point. I had to file my stories from Western Union in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's like a telegram, right? Yes. Yes. You know, you since you began at that point uh, when India was seen with a great deal of suspicion, even uh, it was considered sort of a hostile place for the U.S. policy. What kind of pushback or suspicions did you face while interacting with officials and politicians? I don't think they were suspicious of me per se or Indian journalists per se. I mean, India just wasn't important uh, in terms of the pecking order, in terms of US policy, etc. You know, Pakistan was much more important. So because the Afghanistan war was going on and Pakistan was used for supplying weapons and money to the Mujahideen. India was like seen as a giant headache uh, by the Americans. Uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't say they were suspicious or unkind to me as such, but you know, they just didn't bother. We were not important in their scheme of things. Right. And that's life, you know, uh, their policy goals were different in south asia india had different sort of problems with the americans so right yeah. you know you have, uh, one more question about your early uh, part of your uh, assignment you're coming from india which is not used to things like lobbyists or spies or arms dealers and an assortment of fairly shady characters as well which washington is notorious for how did you, first of all, were you, what, how, how aware were you of that and how did you begin to navigate through all kinds of uh, special interest hovering around Washington? So, see, the really big arms dealers or the big lobbyists, again, for them, India was not important. We were not buying American arms, so I really didn't have any interaction with them. The only sort of, I would, if quote unquote, shady characters one met were uh, fronts of the ISI, the Pakistani uh, intelligence agency. So, you know, in that you came across people like Gulam Nabi Fai or the Khalistani protagonists, you know, Gurmeet Singh Aulak, I remember. Uh, he was also financed uh, by certain interest groups. So those were the kind of interesting characters uh, one met. But the big time arms dealers, it's like, you know, India wasn't an important country for them. We were not buying anything. Right, right. You know, you, you mentioned in your preface, uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing it, uh, from hurling invectives at each other 30 years ago to now being very serious strategic partners. Uh, tell me a bit about how you think the story has unfolded, because you've seen it firsthand. You have had a unique vantage point on that. Yes, so see, uh, in the beginning, in the 80s, 90s, even the 2000s, India and Pakistan were seen as kind of uh, twins. And it was very hard for Indian diplomats to make the Americans understand that uh, Pakistan was financing terrorism in India and that, you know, they ought to keep their eyes open or open their eyes. Then they were selling 
all sorts of technology to China. So India and the US were kind of on opposite sides. The Americans saw India as a Soviet, pro-Soviet country. So they were suspicious of us. Um, then India saw America as the country that sent the Seventh Fleet uh, during the Bangladesh War to threaten India. So there were these deep, deep causes uh, for suspicion. Uh, then Americans, to the extent they were interested in India, was only for non-proliferation concerns. You know, they were uh, very sort of worried about India's missile and nuclear program. All that started to change as India's economy grew. You know, Manmohan Singh implemented reforms. India became kind of an emerging market and its footprint became larger. And then the whole IT revolution in India, that was a significant thing that happened that made the Americans sort of sit up and take notice. Then the very final thing uh, is China, the rise of China. Uh, that made the US sort of recalculate its strategy in Asia because from the time of Bill Clinton, they were selling technology to China, which they are now trying to curb. Uh, China has bought a lot from the US openly, legally, and you know, uh, American corporations have benefited hugely. Now the uh, thing has turned, uh, now the US sees China as a rival. So India is seen as one country in Asia that is large, that is uh, uh, has a big economy, is the fifth largest economy, that can counter China or manage the rise of China. Right. You make an interesting reference in your, again, preface about how uh, it, it's a combination, in your words, of corporate greed, corruption, misjudgment, and the attitude that uh, no non-Western power could ever rise against the U.S. And they, in, in fact, help China rise from puberty to adulthood, again, in your uh, expression. Uh, what do you think were the, were the factors there? What, what was America thinking? Because the US, Soviet Union was unraveling. Uh, uh, yes. So, so tell me a bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, so there was a lot of arrogance at that time. The uh, the unipolar moment when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the Americans were ascendant. They never thought that anyone, any other country could become a rival. And it took them nearly 20 years, I would say, to realize China's goals and China's uh, plans, you know. Um, and they still thought that no non-Western power can displace them. It's only when they noticed, again, during Bill Clinton's time, the most sophisticated nuclear warhead. Um, the Chinese had a mole in the defense laboratory, the Los Alamos, I think, if I remember correctly. They stole that design. And how did the Americans realize that? It's with the next nuclear test that China did. Uh, and the Americans studied the results and they realized that um, the design had been stolen from them. That was a big wake up call. But even then, Clinton didn't sort of take any steps. China was selling M11 missiles to Pakistan. China was selling ring magnets for nuclear weapons to Pakistan. The Americans were just sort of winking and nodding. It's when Xi Jinping came during Obama administration, it became clear, uh, especially in 2008, the financial crisis sort of became clear that his plan is not to have a G2, so to say, which is you know China and the US together managing this huge yeah. world and sort of dividing the areas of responsibilities as it were. His Xi Jinping's idea was to displace the US and become the preeminent power, uh, China occupying the preeminent position. That's when the Americans started to wake up. So I would say during Obama, they started to wake up a bit. During Trump, 
administration, things became more open and Trump was very open about uh, countering China. And with the Biden administration, uh, they have actual policies in place. They have a plan how to sort of deal with this. How successful do you think they have been? Because China obviously has grown dramatically and its, it's influence. In fact, its footprint sometimes seems much, much bigger than the US. Say, for instance, in Africa, parts of the Middle East, uh, even in uh, Southeast Asia, the US almost seems like an incidental player now. Uh, that's my sense. What is your sense? Well, um... I think in terms of sheer military prowess, U.S. still is uh, number one. But you're right, the presence of China is uh, all across the world. It's in India's neighborhood. It's in Africa, in Latin America. They, Because, you know, I feel the Chinese are very smart. They plan for the next 20 years, 30 years, even 100 years. Right. The American window of thinking of electoral politics is four years at best. Then uh, every time a new president comes, then maybe there's a recalculation, a re-emphasis, uh, nuances change. So it's, you know, it's a democracy. China doesn't have any problems about being a democracy. They just plan and go ahead with it. Now, the question about that you asked, how effective uh, is the U.S.? remains to be seen. They are doing a lot of new things like this whole Indo-Pacific policy, the grouping of Quad, which is the four countries, four democracies, the US, India, Australia, and Japan, they are coming together to sort of present a, an alternate view, an alternate way of being, a democratic way of being to other countries. Because uh, don't forget that China, while it seems omnipresent, some of its practices are, uh, you know, trapping countries in huge debts. Like our neighbor, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, they are all realizing that, you know, climbing on the Chinese bandwagon may not be the best thing. Right. Because their policies are opaque. They're not, you know, uh, no, they're not answerable in any sort of court. And what they do is they buy three generations of uh, political leadership in any country. Right. So uh, the elite, the elite may benefit, but the people, like in Africa, there've been protests and things, right. but the people don't necessarily benefit uh, that much. You know, they are sort of uh, the global version of loan sharks, uh, and they've done it very well. Uh, you have to hand it to them. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I give them 10 out of 10 for uh, doing what they plan to do and then actually ac accomplishing it. Yeah. You know, since I, I've been involved with uh, China-Tibet uh, theme for a long time, uh, my reading has always suggested that China has historically considered itself as the center of the world. And it, it sees everything else as uh, the area they can expand to. You know, this very long term, even millennial view that China has had for a long time. I don't think the U.S. or any other Western power is in a position to calibrate that kind of philosophy. Yeah, I don't know if they cannot, but yeah, it certainly would appear so because, you know, the whole Chinese philosophy of uh, being, uh, they being at the center and everybody has to pay tribute and right. your importance is uh, determined by uh, by the Chinese and there are these concentric circles of countries paying homage to them. Um, but let's hope, uh, I don't know how effective Western democracies can be against China. Even Europe is not fully on board with the U.S. on countering China because there's so much uh, sort of corporate interests involved, right? right? And when it comes to democracies, those corporate interests have influence on policymaking. Yeah. And then you just have a problem and you have a mishmash of policies.
Yeah. Speaking of the main theme of your book, the India-US story, uh, my yeah. sense, again, I, uh, it has been that uh, even this government, uh, the government of Prime Minister Modi, has been practicing a sort of a version of non-alignment 2.0 without really saying it because it reminds them of Jawaharlal Nehru. And that's a complete no-no. But the simple fact is even on something like Ukraine, uh, it was very clear where India was coming from. It is a, it is non-aligned thinking. What is your sense? Well, I think uh, according to the Modi government, and if you listen to the foreign minister, he wants engagement all around. You know, um, uh, the U.S. is important uh, for India in terms of countering China or managing China, because when the Americans are with you, then the Chinese take notice. <clears throat> and then uh, India wants a multipolar world, basically. There, uh, In that, I think, uh, yes, there is some hesitation because the philosophy is of strategic autonomy that, that India is uh, pursuing where we make our own decisions and do our own thing, maintain as much independence as possible. So India will never be a treaty ally. Uh, I mean, one shouldn't use the word never, but right. it seems India would is uh, not interested in signing uh, the documents and becoming a treaty ally because then India fears that you might get involved in various wars that let's say the United States engages in <clears throat> and you might be asked to do things you're not comfortable with, like sending uh, troops uh, to a conflict zone. Right. So India wants to keep its option open. and uh, But from what I can see, uh, the imp importance of the U.S. relationship is immense now in Indian calculation. We need the U.S. for technology, for development, for, you know, the Make in India program in terms of defense. India is trying to diversify from dependence on Russia. So the two options are France, um, U.S., and Israel, of course. Three right. options, I should right. say. Yeah. In, in cricketing parlance, uh, your title, uh, Friends with Benefits, offers me a sort of a half volley. It's an easy ball to hit. What are, what are these broad benefits that strike you at this stage of the game? So, you know, this title caused a lot of... Uh, <laughs> interest and mirth people wondered you know why this naughty title because it's a great movie. title it's a great yeah. title so um it was to convey that um india and the us are really good friends they're strategic partners but not allies and us uh, india is not an enemy of the us either so we're somewhere in between to sort of con convey this um, broadly, I thought this title would uh, would convey that, that short of being an ally, ally but more than a friend. Right. You know, it, it, it's almost like it, it, it has the tumult of two lovers who cannot decide whether they should completely love each other or completely hate each other. And in the process, you get this remarkable dynamic that you talk about. How much has that tumult settled down in your assessment? To a great degree, to a great degree. Uh, we're not fighting with each other anymore. There's no invective even, even after the Ukraine war, where India took, you know, uh, some have called it a pro-Russia stand. India uh, would dispute that, but Americans were not happy with it, right? In the beginning. Right. Um, a cable was to go out to 50 US embassies uh, to say that this is, you know, India should not be on the side of uh, Russia and should condemn the invasion, but that the cable was stopped um, in time. And then the, I think, remarkable diplomacy by Minister Jay Shankar to sort of explain India's point of view and do this big pushback at various think tanks across Europe and in the US, where he said, look, uh, 
India has to serve its own national interest. And um, the dependence uh, for weapons, we cannot afford to alienate Russia at a time when we have the Chinese on our heads, right? Since 2020, you know about the Galvan crisis. Uh, they have, uh, the Chinese have threatened India. They are doing things in Arunachal Pradesh. So at a time like this, uh, we cannot afford to alienate Russia and because Russia could turn uh, against India. And then what happens? Will the Americans come to sort of rescue us besides, you know, apart from giving intelligence information, how, uh, you know, what's going to happen? So India has to play it very uh, sort of, um, what should I say, very calmly, you know, it cannot get caught up in the moral rhetoric of the West. Right. right. That much is quite clear. Just last couple of things. One is, of course, with the Afghanistan engagement having ended, of course, in a disaster, but still having ended. The, uh, what is the what is the significance that U.S. attaches uh, to Pakistan? I mean, it remains an important place for the U.S. But in the context of the India-Pakistan dynamic, uh, where do you think uh, that is heading now? Well, the glory days are over for Pakistan, that's for sure. You know, at a time when the Americans were completely dependent, uh, when they were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, Pakistan was uh, was on top of on top of the priority list. But then came, you know, Osama bin Laden was found to be there. Then all the terrorism that has emanated from Pakistan. Then the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan really reduced their importance. So now I think the Americans, I would say, more or less tolerate them. Uh, I cannot think of any champion of Pakistan currently in Washington who would go to bat for them. They, uh, you know, have lobbyists and all that. But in the U.S. strategic calculus, the relationship with India is qualitative, quantitatively different from what they have with Pakistan. They cannot jettison Pakistan, I would say, because um, there is, uh, you know, it's a nuclear weapon state. And um, I think even India wouldn't like that, that uh, Pakistan goes completely uh, sort of adrift right. or goes completely into the Chinese camp, right? So if the Americans have some interference in Pakistan, that's okay. But it's not as if uh, they um, think of Pakistan every morning anymore. Right. You know, for, for all practical purposes, uh, Pakistan is in the Chinese orbit. It's almost like a satellite state. And China making inroads into Afghanistan for any number of reasons, including minerals, etc. Isn't that already a uh, fait accompli? Well, the Pakistani establishment is a very complicated thing. So there are parts of the establishment, parts of the army, parts of the elite who don't want to break uh, uh, relations with the U.S. Because, you know, they benefit. Their children study in the U.S. Right. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of cachet. I mean, where do kids want to come and study? Not they, Beijing. <laughs> not Beijing. That's not the first choice. Right. Although increasingly, Indian students go there to study. I'm not denying that. But the first choice remains the United States, remains the UK or some Western country, right? So the same for the Pakistanis. So these, the part of the army establishment uh, has been yeah. trying to sort of curry favor with the Biden administration and uh, the Biden administration needs them for some sort of intelligence, right? right? So they have eyes and ears in the region. So uh, in order for Afghanistan not to become completely uh, another haven for terrorists, the Americans need to have relations with Pakistan, or at least that's what they tell us. Right. And, and finally, how do you see the Biden-Modi equation? Uh, it, it doesn't seem extremely effusive, exciting. It's there. It's almost utilitarian. Uh, what is your sense? 
uh, here, see, if you uh, don't uh, sort of think about the event management aspect of when they meet, uh, Biden has a long abiding interest in India. That's for sure. Yeah, sure. Um, and um, that since he was a senator, he uh, has been interested in India when we were under sanctions after the nuclear test. It was Senator Biden who argued with Clinton that you cannot have a country as large as India be under sanctions forever. You've got to make new laws. So Biden has an interest in India. He understands the importance of India. Now Modi is the leader there. You know, for all practical purposes, they get along, they're getting along fine. The White House is quite engaged with India. The administration has spent uh, and has had more visits to India than any other in the first two years. So those are just facts. So if you look at the metrics, right. uh, it doesn't matter really almost who's on top. The idea is the US needs wants good relations with India. India wants good relations uh, with the US. I'm not saying the, uh, the relationship is on autopilot yet. I'm not right. saying that. Leaders are still important. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether Biden likes Modi or Modi likes Biden. Right. All that is just for, uh, you know, image indeed. building. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And to, before I let you go, very minor, narrow context, although important from the Indian standpoint. How do you think something like the BBC documentary would play in, a, in, a, in, in Washington, especially Biden, Washington, which has been known to be obsessed with issues like this? Yes. So uh, this BBC documentary, the timing of it and everything um, is problematic. It's going to raise some hackles in Washington, especially with the progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, so you may get a few statements from the spokesperson. But, you know, I'd like to say that the government of India has to realize, especially maybe this government, that the more you ban things, the more attention you bring to them. You know, let it be. What's a documentary? If, if you are convinced of the greatness of the leadership, you're convinced of the greatness of the Supreme Court, why do you have to ban it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, so, in, in that context, the earlier documentary, The Final Solution, was far more damning. It's still around. Uh, and I find this is absolute panic that they are displaying. Uh, and in banning it. Yeah, I'm in India right now, so I haven't seen the documentary um, yeah. because we cannot access it. So when I go to Washington, maybe I can watch it. Yeah, I watched it. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I wrote a piece for someone. It, it's sort of a recycled version with high def and a, a better accent. It's the same material except the British Foreign Office report. But it's essentially the recycled stuff, but it's making an impact in some sense. Yeah, and we, uh, India can expect more of this because there will be a segment of people who will keep raising this against uh, the prime minister. and But they have to find a more intelligent way to counter okay. this rather okay. than ban, ban, ban. I mean, it just for a democracy to keep banning uh, things, it... Uh, <laughs> doesn't look good. No, it doesn't. 